Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're, we will um, go ahead and get started so we can stay on time because I know um, we have a large a topic to cover called insects, <laughs> and there's a lot to say. So I want to welcome everyone and make sure you know that this meeting is being recorded, and we will post the recorded meeting up on the Wild About Insects webpage. I'll email everyone with that link, and so everyone who's registered will get that link. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, my two guest speakers, and then I'll go through a brief agenda, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So our first speaker is Jonathan Mosley. Uh, he's a conservation scientist and author. He currently works with me at the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, where he's a science advisor. But he's also worked at many other places, like Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Heinz Center for Science, Economics, Environment, and Society for Conservation Biology. Um, he's a postdoc fellow at the Smithsonian Institution and alumnus of National Conservation Leadership Institute, or NCLI. Um, Jonathan knows so much about insects. He's my go-to guy for just about everything here at Aqua. He's super, super smart. Um, and I think you'll all enjoy what he has to present to you today. Our second speaker is Thelma Reddick, and she's the Senior Director of Conservation Content and Partnerships at the Wildlife Habitat Council. Um, she's been in the field for over 25 years and working on conservation education and community engagement, specializing in place-based learning and building productive partnerships. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Wildlife Habitat Council, I would encourage you to check out that great organization. They work really hard to develop great partnerships with for-profit and non-profit entities and building and creating habitat for wildlife around the world. Our agenda for today, um, I'm going to introduce John, or I'll, I'll uh, have Jonathan present about insects and his focus today is going to be on pollinators. And then uh, Selma will talk to us about how we can encourage pollinators in our local area. Um, I'll present to you a little bit about what Project Wild is doing in terms of um, offering education opportunities on insects and pollinators. And then at the end, we'll open it up for questions. And the best place to type your questions is in the chat box. Um, and I'll be monitoring that. Uh, so if you have a question at any time, go ahead and just type it in the chat box and I'll keep track of it there. Okay, so um, I completely forgot um, to show you. Here's Jonathan. <laughs> I forgot uh, my own presentation. So that's Jonathan Mosley and then Thelma Reddick. Um, so, Jonathan, I'm going to hand it over to Great. you, and I'm going to give just a minute to call up your presentation. Sorry, folks, bear with me just one second. Okay, now, it's like, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, you have to get the right order. Oh, right, yes, exactly. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Elena, and thank you to all of you for participating in the webinar today. I'm Jonathan Maudsley. I'm the Science Advisor at the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And by training, I'm an entomologist and still maintain a fairly active research program, um, even though I do lots of other things in my day job at the association. Insects are near, near and dear to my heart. And when Elena started talking about doing a webinar about insects in 30 minutes, it's an immense field. I mean, you will see some numbers later on, just how many different kinds of insects there are out there. And so what I thought would be helpful would be to talk about some things having to do with insect pollinators, some basic facts, some things from my own research and own experience, some cool pictures, and then a little bit of practical things, places you can go to get more resources and advice, particularly on the internet about insects, insect conservation, 
and pollinator conservation. So um, starting from the very beginning, flowering plants have a, a system whereby pollen is transferred from one part of the flower to a different part of the flower, or a different flower on a plant. And that can be done in a variety of ways. Um, wind pollination, of course, those of us in the Eastern United States, we've got trees, uh, we've got oaks and pines and other things like that that are dumping copious pollen into the air. But a totally different system involves animals as intermediaries to transfer pollen between one part of the plant to another. And in this case, they're known as pollinators. And they're absolutely essential for many plant species in order to complete their reproductive cycles and produce fruit and seeds. So animals, uh, from the animal perspective, animals visit flowers for lots of different reasons. Um, there are things we call floral rewards. The most obvious of these are pollen and nectar, but there's sometimes other chemical compounds that they can pick up. Um, they uh, often will find members of the opposite sex there for reproductive purposes. Um, there are many insects that also visit flowers to find prey. Elena had a praying mantis on before, and you'll often see mantids on flowers. Uh, they're not particularly good pollinators, but they are good at eating pollinators. So that's just something to, to be thinking about. Um, there are a lot of insects that will actually lay their eggs on flowers and then they're, they, they will either, the larval insects will develop in the fruit or seeds of the plant itself. And sometimes there are these very interesting parasitic relationships where the eggs will, or larvae will hit, hitchhike back to the nest of another insect where they'll complete their development. Um, sunbathing. Uh, one thing that's always important to keep in mind when you're thinking about insects is that while there are things that they can do to raise their body temperature, they're much more dependent on external energy sources, external heat sources for their body uh, warming than we are as uh, the sort of warm-blooded animals, as mammals that we are. So insects will often visit flowers just to sort of hang out and bathe in the sun and get the thermal energy they need in order to be able to become active. Doing all these things and many other things they may happen to acquire pollen. And if they happen to move from flower to flower or transport the, the pollen from one plant reproductive part to another plant reproductive part, pollination may occur and the plant will be fertilized and produce fruit and seeds. So pollinators are important to people for a number of very key reasons. Uh, it's been estimated that about three quarters of the plant species that we use as food crops require animal pollinators. And the big crops that we grow in the United States, things like corn and wheat and uh, some of the other grass-derived species are not pollinated generally by animals. What are pollinated by animals are all the plants that make food either nutritious or fun or diverse or, or tasty or spicy, things like fruits, vegetables, uh, almonds. There's lots and lots of different crop species that require animals to pollinate them. And these are the things that really make food interesting and that from, from my perspective, make life worth living. And so we're critically important to have animal pollinators perform these services. Um, Jonathan, I'm gonna stop you for one second. I'm getting some comments that people can't see the slideshow. Okay. So I'm not sure, sure what's going on. Um, Please bear with us while we have technical issues here. The first slide, but hmm. let's see. Ah. Okay, one second here. What slide number are you on? I don't, I can look it up. We are on, should be four, I think. Hold on one second. Okay, they're just seeing a screenshot. It says. Hmm. Okay. Alright, I'm getting some advice here. Yeah. These people are only seeing that first one. Oh, weird. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
There we go. Is that working better now? People see the slide that says pollinators are important to humans. There we go. Great. I don't know what happened there. Great, thank you. Um, so to reiterate, about three quarters of the plant species that we use as food crops require animals for pollination. And it's been estimated that approximately one third of the food that we eat every day depends on animal pollinators. Again, these are the things that make uh, our food taste good. They're the things that provide us with nutrition and vitamins and minerals and so forth. So we really owe a lot to pollinators. And it's been estimated, and this is a, a fact that's a couple years old now and it probably needs to be updated, insect pollinators in the U.S. produce at least $10 billion worth of products each year. And those are products derived directly from pollinated plants. We're not looking at benefits, broader benefits to agricultural ecosystems or anything like that. This is just products that are come directly from insect pollination. So they're tremendously valuable in a purely economic sense as well. Pollinators are also incredibly important ecologically in terms of maintaining healthy ecosystems. I mean, if you think about all of the plants that are out there, whether in, they're in a prairie or a forest or a woodland, a very, all of those plants have to be pollinated and many of them rely on insect pollinators, animal pollinators in order to complete their reproductive cycles. It's been estimated that up approximately 90% of the flowering plant species in the world need animal pollinators. That's almost 300,000 flowering plant species. And the pollinators themselves are actually a very significant part of global biodiversity. If you add up all the groups of living things that pollinate plants, we find there's an incredible number of pollinator species in the world. This is a minimum estimate based on things that we know actually pollinate. There's at least 290,000 species of animals worldwide. And you can see some of the diversity around here. And we'll talk a little bit more about each of these groups in a little bit more detail. But again, pollinators are important for maintaining biodiversity. They're an important part of biodiversity themselves. So a little bit about insects, and this is why I was, you know, when Elena talked about doing a webinar in 30 minutes, um, we're dealing with an absolutely immense number of living things here. We don't really know even to the nearest order of magnitude how many different kinds of insects there are. The minimum estimate, I think, is about one and a half million. Most entomologists would say around two. And then the upper limit, um, my postdoc advisor, Terry Irwin at the Smithsonian, famously published a paper where he claimed there might be 30 million insect species. There was a fellow at the Natural History Museum in London who said there might be 100 million. The truth is we don't really know. And this is what's so cool about entomology. And one of the things that I find just amazing is there's so much that we don't know, and there's so much that people uh, will learn in our lifetimes about insects. And there's so much opportunity for students and young people today to be able to really advance science. And under the, you're, you're right at the frontiers of understanding and knowledge when you start looking at insects. There are things that you can find in your backyard that no scientist has ever looked at, that no one has ever studied. There are questions about trees that I have growing in my yard that are critically important. What pollinates tulip tree or tulip poplar that nobody's ever looked at. And so the opportunities for adding new knowledge and new discoveries are just immense here. And if you have students who have inquiring minds or are really interested in nature, this is an area where you can really make some significant discoveries. It's, we're in an era where it's very difficult to discover new things. You know the, we have Google Earth to map the, the world, and we understand so many different things about uh, all sorts of other areas of inquiry. But entomology, there's a wealth of new discoveries out there waiting to be made. In the United States alone, we have 91,000 insect species that have had Latin names put on them. And the best estimate from my friends at the Smithsonian is that we have about 73,000 more to go. Um, and that's pretty typical for the rest of the world as well. Um, looking specifically at the major pollinator group of bees, we have 4,000 species of native bees in North America. When we think of bees, most people think of honeybees and maybe bumblebees, but there's an immense number of species of native bees. And the same thing is true worldwide. There's about 16,000 bee species worldwide. And again, those are just the ones that scientists have put names on. There are new species being discovered all the time. This is a very active field of research. 
So a little bit of introductory information about the major pollinator groups. And while we go through this, I'll talk about some of the things I've studied and some pictures from my own field research that hopefully will be interesting to you. We'll start with bees because this is the group most people are aware of. And most people, when you think of bees, you think of honeybees, which are the, the social bees on the right. These are kept in a sort of quasi-domestic agricultural settings and they're used to pollinate crops around the world. We've essentially taken this species and spread it around the world through human um, husbandry and, and beekeeping. The bee on the left is a solitary bee. It's a carpenter bee, and she's actually on a milkweed plant. Um, so that's to represent the incredible diversity of solitary bees and non-social bees in the, uh, that exist in the world. This is a, a shameless plug, plug for a friend. This is a, this is a honeybee that's been photographed using a special process. And the, the fellow's name who does this is Sam Droge, D-R-O-E-G-E, -E, and he's with the USGS Bee Monitoring Laboratory. And he takes these stunning pictures of bees. You can see, literally see every hair on this bee. But again, this is a social bee. This is, this is actually a drone. This is the male of the species. But um, he, he makes these photos freely available through Flickr, and anyone is welcome to use them, download them, put them in your art product, share them with your students, anything like that. It's a great resource and he's a good friend and he's just delighted to be able to make some of these things available. But this shows you uh, up close what a honeybee looks like. Um, again, these are social bees. This is probably the most familiar bee for most people. Uh, there's very active beekeeping groups in a lot of, of uh, the United States. And personally, I found it very stimulating when I was in school when we would have native uh, beekeepers come in, local beekeepers come in and talk about their honeybee hives and share the, the wonders of the honeybee world with students. So these are a little bit different bees. These are bees that I've studied. Um, the one on the left was from Borneo and the ones on the right are from other places in Southeast Asia. But you notice they look really different, they're blue. And this is one of those mysteries of the universe. No one knows why these bees are blue. Uh, but they are, and they're very common and abundant. These are carpenter bees. They nest in wood, and it's just a, one of these super cool things that, again, it's a mystery of the universe. No one knows exactly why they have those colors. Bees also have some really wild colors as well. The one at the top has these gorgeous green on its wings. One on the bottom is bright orange red. These two are bees that I've actually seen in the wild. Uh, the one on the top is in Southeast Asia. The one on the bottom is from Africa. And the one on the top is one of the largest bees in the world. It's literally about the size of your thumb. And uh, they, they can sting, but fortunately they're not particularly ferocious or aggressive. Again, these are carpenter bees as well. These are pictures of what they look like alive. Um, one on the left is in South Africa. And you'll see it has these beautiful blue wings that didn't show up well in the other picture. The one on the right is uh, was actually taken in the Philippines and it's visiting these just gigantic flowers. and if you look carefully, you can see it's got pollen on its head. This is clearly a bee that's functioning as a good pollinator in spite of its immense size. Here's another group of bees. These are uh, ones that are from South America. And there's a couple cool things about these I wanted to share with you. These are pollinators of a lot of tropical forest crops. So if you've ever eaten Brazil nuts, the Brazil nut tree has to grow in primary rainforest. And it's pollinated primarily by these bees. And again, these are very large bees. They're about the size of the, perhaps the end of your little finger. And um, they, again, they're not particularly aggressive, but they are found in tropical forests. And one thing that we have discovering with these is that as the climate changes, they are actually moving to the north. The one at the top has been recorded now from Texas. They're not killer bees, so they're nothing to be worried about. It's just one of those really interesting things that's happening in the natural world. And again, this is in many cases, these things are being noticed by amateurs, by people who are not professional entomologists. So there's tremendous opportunity for people at all levels to be observing these insects and tracking what's happening in their, in their lives. One more shameless uh, plug from my friend, Sam Drogi. This is an orchid bee, a long tongue orchid bee, just to give you a sense of how beautiful some of these animals can be. This particular species is from Guyana and it's got a very long tongue in order to extract nectar out of the orchid plants. And there's a whole group of these, uh, dozens and dozens of species in the tropics. Some of them are brilliant green. This one's lovely purple and, um, and lavender. 
but they're just gorgeous bees and they have all uh, have these very close relationships with particular species of orchids. We see this a lot when you get into the salt, the native bees, the bees that don't live in social communities. There are often these very tight relationships between the bee species and the flower that they pollinate. So moving on, another major group of insect visitors are butterflies and moths. And for the longest time, we really had no idea whether butterflies actually pollinated anything or not. And in recent years, we've discovered that they actually, yes, in fact, they do actually pollinate and that in, in fact, milkweed, which is the host plant of the monarch butterfly, is pollinated uh, by a number of species of butterflies. The one on the right is a day flying hawk moth. These are super cool. They look just like little hummingbirds and uh, they are actually excellent pollinators. They have a hairy body that traps pollen and they're something that are very easy to see. They live throughout North America. They're very easy to find. Bats, this is a wonderful uh, long tongue nectar feeding bat. Uh, many of the plants in the southwestern United States, particularly cacti and also things like agave are, are pollinated by bat species. And our, our bats are critically imperiled by a number of factors, not the least of which is this horrible white nose disease fungus that's moving across North America and could devastate many of our native bat species. Birds, I think um, we're all familiar with hummingbirds. Hummingbirds and, and related birds are actually can be very good pollinators. There are a number of plant species in North America that are primarily pollinated by birds. They typically are red and, or orange and have long tubular corollas or stems uh, leading down to the nectar. But this is another great group. Um, again, one which is a subject of active research, despite the fact that we've known about these birds for hundreds of years relatively little has been done to study their biology and investigate what exactly they're doing with the flowers. Um, flies. I, I think most of us probably have a negative impression of flies because of things like mosquitoes and black flies and so forth and horse flies, but there are many flies that occur on flowers. This is a fly from Southern California called the Delhi Sands flower loving fly. It was actually the first fly listed under the U.S. Endangered Species Act and it is critically imperiled and it's found in a small area of Southern California. And we know very little about this species other than that the adults are found on flowers and similar related species are known to be pollinators. So there are many, many different species of flies that are pollinators. And beetles can also be pollinators too. This is a group that's very ancient. We know a lot about the fossil history of beetles, fossil history of flowers. It's thought that some of the very earliest flowers of were pollinated by beetles and uh, we still see many beetles today that are uh, that pollinate flowers. These are some pictures from my own research in South Africa. There's a number of these scarab beetles that are found on flowers and some of them are very beautiful and have lots of spots and stripes and everything. We've actually been able to document them acquiring pollen and transporting pollen and actually pollinating flowers. So all is not well in the world of pollinators, and what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about some of the conservation concerns that have been noted by my friends in the pollinator uh, conservation community and folks who study pollinators. Um, we have very good evidence of decline in, in North America, of declines in wild honeybees. We've lost a lot of uh, wild honeybee colonies as a result of mites and introduced diseases. And also in some native bees, including certain bumblebees. There's a group of bumblebees that's been in significant decline, and several of those have actually been petitioned for listing under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. Uh, colony collapse disorder in managed honeybee hives has been a significant issue, and there's been quite a bit of interest on the part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture in colony collapse disorder, and there's a whole task force and group of people who are actively looking at this particular um, incident that's taking place within managed honeybee hives. At the moment, we have 38 pollinator species that are on our endangered species list in the US, which include two of the bats and 13 birds and 22 butterflies and moths and the fly that I showed you the picture of. Many of these birds are actually in Hawaii where many of the plants are actually dependent on native bird species for pollination. I think many of you have probably seen the graphs like this one. This is one of our native um, 
flower visiting species. I hesitate to call it a pollinator simply because we don't have enough evidence to indicate that it actually is a pollinator, but it probably pollinates things. This is the monarch butterfly, which has this absolutely spectacular migration each fall where the different generations of the butterfly move north in the spring and then every fall there's a generation that migrates down to Mexico and also to points. There are other ones that migrate to points in California. They overwinter and then they fly back north in successive generations. And over the last 20 years, the number of the butterflies, the, actually the area occupied by butterflies at the overwintering sites, both in Mexico and California, has declined dramatically. And so there's been a proposal to possibly list this. What it, it remains a relatively common butterfly under the U.S. Endangered Species Act, primarily to address some of the issues related to its decline and the declining area at the overwintering sites. So what is driving the, the declines in pollinators that we're seeing? I think the number one thing that everyone agrees is habitat loss. As habitats are being converted over into all sorts of other things, whether that's housing development, shopping malls, roads, et cetera, pollinator habitat is being lost and this is driving declines. The, uh, for example, the monarch butterfly, there have been some studies published that attribute the uh, declines almost entirely to the loss of certain edge habitats and similar related habitats around agricultural fields. So habitat loss is thought to be the major driver. We also have issues with pesticide use, inappropriate use of pesticides. There are also pesticides that are very efficient and effective at killing broad spectrum insects. And again, these are not necessarily problematic if used appropriately and under appropriate conditions, but there are definitely concerns with the different forms of pesticide use. And I think it's something that a lot of people are looking at from a research perspective to figure out how we can minimize this particular kind of risk to pollinators. Um, introduced diseases and parasites, these are mites on a honeybee pupa. Um, this bite mite has been introduced and is causing a great deal of havoc among managed beekeeping um, uh, honeybee colonies. Um, I would point you at this book called The Forgotten Pollinators. It's a little bit old nowadays, but uh, it came out in the late 90s, but it does a beautiful job. It's by Gary Paul Nabham and Stephen Bookman, and they do a beautiful job of outlining the concerns about pollinators. This was really the, the seminal publication that put pollinators on the map from a conservation perspective. And it's, it, you can get it through Amazon and other sources, and it, it tells quite a bit of information and useful facts about pollinators and the plight of pollinators. Again, it's a little bit out of date, but it's a, a really good resource to go to. Um, another place, uh, as a result of that, that book, there was a, a group started called the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign. And I was fortunate to be involved in the very early years of this. And the Pollinator Protection Campaign continues to this day and has sort of morphed into another thing called the Pollinator Partnership, pollinator.org, which has a lot of resources available for people who are interested in learning more about pollinators and more specifically what you can actually do in your own yard, your home, your neighborhood, your church, your synagogue, your school, in order to take positive action for pollinators. So pollinator.org is one resource. One thing that gets mentioned a lot in the internet literature on pollinators are the idea of pollinator gardens or pollinator plantings. And so I'll talk a little bit about this quickly here as something that we can all do even in our own backyards or even on the literally the balcony of your apartment building to help improve the quality of habitat for our pollinator species. And that is to put out uh, plantings for native pollinators. And uh, there's a couple pr key principles here that are emphasized over and over again. The use of native plants, for example, um, trying to have a diversity of plant species, not just one particular plant species. And think about having plants that are blooming throughout the growing season, not just things that bloom in the spring or in the fall, but have things that bloom throughout the year because in many cases, the pollinators themselves are active year round as well, or at least during the, the summer, spring, summer growing season. Uh, one thing we're going to talk about a little bit when we, we talk about insect houses, insect hotels, is the importance of structure, both for nesting and for places for insects to hide. There are some things like rocks and logs that can be really good if you have the room for them or something like an insect hotel. 
or a bee hotel or a bee block, those can all be very good to provide habitat for pollinators. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize here that I think it really goes against the grain for a lot of us who are gardeners is that bare dirt is actually really good. About 60% of our native bee species nest in the ground and they really like bare dirt. So if you have a small bare patch, um, at least where I live in Maryland, you will often find bees emerging and nesting there in the springtime. And again, these are not social bees. They're not defending a nest. They're not going to sting readily. And they are incredibly beneficial when it comes to pollinating native plants. So there's an organization out there called the Xerxes Society, which is really one of the very few organizations that's dedicated entirely to insect conservation. And they have pollinator-friendly plant lists available there are a number of these lists available out there on the web, but you can find lists of plants that you can plant in your area to benefit specific pollinator species. Again, many of these lists are, have taken into account these different criteria here in terms of native plant species, diversity, blooming at different points of the growing season and, and so forth. So these plantings can really go anywhere. Uh, these are two that I literally took pictures of this morning on my way into the office. The one at the top is actually uh, along a street and it's, there's a little bus stop and someone has put in a bunch of native plants there. You can see that it's been groomed heavily and I think that there's research that shows that that actually improves the social acceptance of the plot. If it doesn't look like a, a weedy patch, if it's a little bit neater, people may be more accepting of it. The one at the bottom is, uh, again, that's just a median along the a residential street where there have been a number of plantings. This one in particular, the bottom by the end of the year, it will look like a weedy patch. There's a lot of things that are going to get quite bigger, or quite larger rather in there and that will bloom at different times of the year. So these can go literally anywhere. The um, Monarch Watch project in Kansas, which specializes in conservation advice for the monarch butterfly, says that you can have a milkweed patch of 10 feet by 10 feet and that's uh, a good minimum size to use for the monarch butterfly. Even if you have a couple planters on your balcony or on a porch, those could be beneficial for pollinators too. And don't just take my word for it, there's actually quite a number of published studies now that look at urban pollinators and how different pollinator species are using these urban landscapes. People have looked at green roofs, for example. Uh, in certain, certain parts of the country, people put uh, native plants on the roof to help absorb uh, excess runoff to, so that to slow down the flow of water into the sewer system and so forth. And they have, if you put the appropriate plants up there, those can actually be used by native pollinators. People have looked at these little pollinator gardens and pollinator plantings. This picture here is from a paper that I co-authored along with the students at the University of Maryland. We actually found this very rare bumblebee species right here in the District of Columbia. And the bees were nesting in ornamental grass clumps and they, they have a little nest and they, uh, it, it's a social species. So it has um, cells and uh, honey pots and so forth. And they built their little nests in these grass clumps. And then they were out foraging on lots of different species. Uh, unfortunately, the, the plant here is non-native, but they were taking advantage, full advantage of native as well as non-native floral resources. And again, this was just in, the um, Logan Circle neighborhood, Shaw neighborhood in Northwest DC. And so we, we had a little paper talking about this. This is the kind of thing that you can find all the time, something that really advances the frontiers of knowledge. There's so little we know about insects that almost anything that you observe, anything that you look at is potentially new and different. And it's, it's really a absolutely um, different way of looking at the world and some of these other areas of inquiry, other types of science where we know so much already. There's really great opportunities for students and people who love nature to contribute meaningfully to our understanding of insects. So a couple more resources that I think are very helpful for people who really want to learn more about insects. The first thing that you run into when you start becoming more interested in insects is how do I put names on them? There are a number of field guides out there. There's the old Peterson Field Guide to Insects, the Audubon Society has one, et cetera. This is a website that I recommend for people at all levels. It's called bugguide.net, bugguide.net. 
and it has the you can upload pictures to it and the site is curated by entomologists from around the world. I happen to know on the bee side that one of the world's leading bee taxonomists, he probably knows the world bee fauna better than anyone else. He's at the University of Singapore and he's up every night on Bug Guide looking at new pictures of bees, just hoping that someone gets something cool in there. So you can actually get your insects identified here. And there's also curated pages so that if they say, for example, oh, this is the American bumblebee, Bombus pennsylvanicus. So you can click through to that species or you can put that in the search box and you can look at other people's pictures. They have maps showing where the pictures came from. It's just a great resource. And it's something that, again, has been built up by the community over many years. And like, it's generally very reliable. There are people who have actually looked at the accuracy of this and the kind of information that people make available here. And then finding an entomologist. It used to be that you could find an entomologist at almost any local college. And the old traditional fields like entomology and mammalogy and botany and so forth have been replaced in many cases by people who are broader ecologists or conservation biologists and so forth. And if you're interested in doing anything seriously with insects, um, it can be very profitable to talk with an entomologist to get some ideas. Entomologists are also great people to have come into your classroom because they'll often come in with a box of bugs from you know, the Amazon basin and tropical um, Southeast Asia and these just amazing wild looking things. And those can really turn kids on to how cool insects are, how wild some of these insects look. Um, I would recommend starting with the Entomological Society of America. They're headquartered right here in the Washington, D.C. metro area. Their website is entsoc.org, and they have um, lists of entomologists, professional members all over the United States who would be willing and able, in many cases, to assist. My experience in talking with entomologists is that they are often, in many cases, are delighted to come and speak with students, especially young people who are really interested in the natural world and who have an interest in insects. And uh, I personally benefited greatly from mentoring when I was in junior high and high school from professional entomologists. If you have students who have this interest, it's really worthwhile to think about connecting them with professionals in the field. And there are many people out there who would be interested in, in, interested in doing that and helping students out. So that's um, essentially what I wanted to present to you today. My personal website up there has a little bit more about me and my research in bees, and then that's my email address in case anyone would like to reach out. More than happy to try to answer any questions, and um, either over email or if we have time at the end on this presentation today. So thank you very much for your time. Hopefully that was interesting and useful for you, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you guys today. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I'm gonna take a minute to switch around to get Selma's slides um, up and running. But in the meantime, Jonathan, there was a question. <laughs> uh, Joe would like to know if wasps and hornets and yellow jackets are good pollinators. And he does have a, you know, ulterior motive because those are sometimes kind of nasty insects. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, is, this gets to the, the fact that um, most of the, the really nasty ones, the hornets and yellow jackets, those are social insects and they're defending a nest. And anytime you have something that's defending a nest, you often find very powerful stings. Um, so bumblebees will sting too and under those circumstances. But by and large, um, yellow jackets and hornets are much more aggressive. And the good news is they're they don't pollinate at all. I, I, they're, I, I hesitate to say that because Sometimes you will find males of yellow jackets and hornets on flowers, and they probably do some pollination. But by and large, they're not foraging on plants. They don't feed much on plant material. They feed primarily on other insects. They're predators. They're carnivores and so or scavengers. They also scavenge on dead meat and dead insects and so forth. So they don't have as much of a reason to be visiting flowers as the bees. The bees are collecting they're, they're feeding on nectar and they're collecting pollen for the young bees. And so they are um, much more, um, much, much less, uh, uh, well, I, I should say they're, they're much better pollinators rather than some of these other insects. Now, there are some wasps that do visit 
flowers. Uh, they tend to be solitary wasps, and by and large, they're much less aggressive than the ones that the hornets and yellow jackets. So yeah, hornets and yellow jackets are not good pollinators. All right, thank you, Jonathan. There are some more questions for you in the future, so sure. I hope you can stick around. Yep. Um, but at this time, I want to um, call up Thelma Raddick. Um, so Wildlife Habitat Council last year had a competition about building insect hotels, and I was at their annual conference, and these were just so amazing, and I had never heard of an insect hotel. However, ever since I saw that first insect hotel last fall, I'm We've noticed that um, places like Walmart are selling them, Costco, and you can order them online. Um, however, there are some limitations, and you don't want to just go and get any insect hotel. So, Thelma, I'm going to hand it over to you so you can give us a little bit more information on this. Great, Elena. Happy, happy to be here. And you can just go to the next slide if that's okay. okay. We'll just dive right in. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yes, and, and the fun part is you, you don't have to buy anything. Um, you can really make these yourself. Um, so before we take a look at some examples of insect hotels, let's take a look at why you might want to, to buy one. Um, you might argue that insects can pretty much find homes where uh, find homes for themselves, where they might want to lay their eggs um, and overwinter. And you'd probably have a point, but the, you know, as as we just heard, habitat is in high demand. You know, it, it, it's decreasing in some areas. And so extra habitat is always welcome. And, and But perhaps the biggest reason is that these projects can be really highly visible and can call attention to that state of affairs with insects, that some populations are decreasing, and that we need to kind of pay attention to what's happening to insect populations and to insect habitat. And it's a really nice way to do that and engage the community in that dialogue and to be involved and, and to have um, kind of a, a raise their awareness and to have a stake in that. And another reason is these are projects that you can do. You don't have to order them on Amazon. You can, but um, you can also use recycled and found um, materials. So they're really easy and great ways to kind of dive into a project that you can add to your habitat or your schoolyard or, or your backyard habitat. We can just go on to the next slide there. And um, I'm going to go into some kind of bug hotel basics, if you will. Um, and as, as I go through the basics, I'm going to be showing you some of those examples. We actually have a what we called an insect hotel challenge in, in 2018 and many of our members from our corporate um, conservation members and individuals built bug hotels from actually from seven different countries around the world so I'll be showing a few of those examples many of them that were used as as, um, as overwintering um, habitats for uh, insects a lot of native bees in their areas so you can take a look at those as we go over some basics but um, Really, any size insect hotel will do, but you have to think about placing it in sort of a bug-friendly area. So, so put it in that pollinator garden that um, that we were just talking about um, with Jonathan. Put it in a, a garden, a natural area, or a park, or somewhere where the bugs are. Sunny areas are best. Um, or partly sunny areas. And if you live in a climate that's cooler in the winter, you might want to um, face the opening of the insect hotel away from the prevailing winter winds so that it keeps it warmer. And we'll talk about keeping them warm um, in, in just a minute. We can go on to the next one. And on the next slide, um, we'll take a look at, this is a, a bug hotel that uh, comes to us from Texas. And um, you can use any type of, of wood that you want to in an insect hotel. You can use hardwoods or softwoods, but one thing I want to say is don't use any kind of treated lumber for an insect like a native bee to burrow into um, because treated lumber is treated with chemicals. So if they're going to burrow into it and lay their eggs in that hole, you don't want to use treated lumber. So um, you want to use untreated lumber um, to build your insect hotel. And another warning is um, don't move in logs um, 
or, or any wood products from out of your area because you might actually inadvertently move in some pests or diseases uh, from, from woodlands from other areas. So use locally sourced materials when you're building your insect hotel. And we can go on to the next one. And um, just as Jonathan was mentioning about, you know, the aesthetics, you know, of a, of a nicely pruned garden, you know, is more acceptable to some people than if you leave it very natural and weedy looking. Um, aesthetics are maybe important to your bug hotel. If we look at these two pictures of bug hotels, one of them might be more acceptable to um, to your human community, if you put it in your human community. It might be more aesthetically pleasing from the human eye. But if you think of it from a bug's eye perspective, they're both five-star resorts, okay? From a bug's perspective, these are both great places to move into. So from a bug's perspective, they both provide cover and great winter overwintering habitat. Um, so you have to look at it from a bug's perspective too. But again, if you're putting it in maybe a public park or a schoolyard, um, you might want to go for something that's uh, you know designed a little bit more with that so it's more accessible to humans. But from a bug's perspective, these are both five-star resorts. They're both the Ritz-Carlton. Um, we can go on to the next one. And as you look at the next one, which um, they uh, delightfully call the Hotel California, I wish I would have come up with that name. Um, if you look, it actually has a, a roof on it, as many of the, of the insect hotels do. And that's a really nice feature because that keeps materials that they put inside of it dry. And so any of the, of the insect hotels that are built in the spring, the insects will come around in the summer, and, um, but they'll start to move in and stay over the winter. And that's really important because um, overwintering habitat is really what you're building when you're building an insect hotel. Um, a lot of the smaller insect hotels had a back on them, and that prevents predation from happening. Um, it'll, if you have um, bee tubes in them, which we'll be looking at in a minute, it will prevent any, um, anything from coming in and stealing the eggs out of the back of the bee tubes. But also, um, this insect hotel, you'll notice, is made by, I don't know if you can tell, but it's, it's actually stacked um, pallets that are four feet by four feet, one on top of the other, and stuff full of all sorts of cool things that bugs can crawl into and overwinter there. And, um, and this isn't for native bees so much as other types of bugs like beetles and, and, um, and things like ladybird beetles and, and organisms like that. Um, but they can overwinter in here. And because it's so deep and wide, even when the temperatures drop, they have, it's because it's deep and wide, it's going to stay warm on the inside. If this was in, this happens to be in Florida, but, and it still gets chilly down there, but if it's deep and wide, even in a, in a place where it gets very cold and even snows, a deep and wide insect hotel is going to stay warm in the center, and that's going to keep the bugs warm in the center. Now, if they were out in nature, what they would do is find a nice big hollow tree trunk or, or a, a big rock to be under. But again, habitat is at a premium in some places, so an insect hotel can add that little extra kind of real estate for them to move into. So if we go on to the next slide, I'm gonna show you one that kind of is really great for pollinators, which is what we're kind of concentrating on today. It's one of the best goals that you can set for your insect hotel is to make a home of many species of native bees. We had mentioned, um, Jonathan mentioned 4,000 species of native bees in, in the U.S. And there, I can guarantee you in your state, you have hundreds of native bees and bee-like pollinators in your area. And many of those are solitary nesting bees that will nest in wood. Now, um, it may be hard to know exactly what bees are in your area. I'll give you some more resources in a minute. And, um, but the best way to do that is to provide holes for bees. And you can drill a variety of holes in wood. Um, whether it's logs or, or old lumber. Um, and you can drill holes that are 3 30 seconds to 4 eighths of an inch wide, and you know, maybe about 6 to 8 inches deep, or however deep you can drill them. And, or you can use a variety of, of kind of tubes that they can lay their eggs in. Now, you can buy bee tubes, like I have featured there, and you can buy those, but they're kind of pricey. But nature provides us with a whole lot of natural bee tubes. 
if you have bamboo or phragmites growing in your habitat, in a lot of areas, those are invasive plants that we have, have to manage out as land managers. You can cut those down and dry them out, and they make great bee tubes. You just cut them at, to length and, and put those into your um, insect hotel, and they make great uh, bee tubes for solitary nesting bees and you don't have to pay for those at all. And you're also managing out invasive plants from your habitat. If we go on to the next slide, there's some great resources on native bees. I know we don't have a lot of time, but if you're interested in native bees, and again, it's a huge topic, so this is a great place. Some of them are the Xerxes Society, and um, as, as Jonathan had mentioned, the great um, resource that we have. Um, you can learn more about them there, or um, Go into your favorite search engine and use some of those terms and and look for the some more in, um, information on your own but but those links if you click on that little arrow will take you to some more great information on native bees and then the next slide just gives you an idea of you know yeah you can see the the insect hotels are sort of the the new bird feeder the you know the new hummingbird feeder but it's really fun to use this as a way to recycle materials, build them from materials that you find around your neighborhood, around your house, around um, you know the natural environment, and be really creative with them. And these are just some of the things that you can use, um, and the photo shows as well, um, some of the things that you can use to create habitat for insects. Now, again, the holes are for the native pollinators, some of those native bees that would nest in wood. Um, and the tubes as well, but um, like ladybird beetles, they'll they'll nest in the holes um, as well, and, and in between those little rocks that are in there. And um, lacewing insects, they're a predatory insect that will eat sort of the bad pests in your garden. They'll nest in that dry grass that's in that spot there. So, you know, there's so many things that you can do and be creative with these as well, and have a whole lot of fun with it. Um, if we go on to the next one, if you find you're looking at your insect hotel and things are visiting and, and you'd like to find out a little bit more about them, these are just some great citizen science projects that you might um, want to check out. You might be familiar with them already, Bumblebee Watch and, and Cricket Call. My favorite is Lost Ladybug Project, which is trying to find, um, get sort of a handle on how many of, of our native ladybugs are, are still around in what areas and um, Firefly Watch Project. Now, you probably won't get fireflies in your bug hotel. Uh, you'll probably get them in the long, long grasses that, that might grow around it, um, but it's a great citizen science uh, project. And no, you can't click on the links right here, but we will send you a copy of, the, of this. I'm sure, can't we send them a copy, Elena, and then they can use the link, and um, mm -hmm. you can, and check out those links later on. And that's all I had, because I know, Elena, you had some things to share as well. Thanks for letting me come on. I do, and I'm gonna transition the slides again and ask another question um, for Jonathan. Um, you showed a butterfly garden on your way mm -hmm. to the bus stop. Uh, is there an issue with having the butterfly garden near the street where the butterflies may come in and get hit by cars or something? Yeah, it depends on the traffic. That's a good question. Um, that's a fairly quiet area, so the answer for that particular garden is probably not. Um, I know that folks at the Xerxes Society have actually been looking at this, not so much for, you know, urban areas where traffic is usually, while it may be very, uh, you'll have very high densities of cars, they may not be moving all that fast. They're actually looking at highway medians, and so there's a sort of like the, the the there's a strip on either side of the highway where there actually is some sort of an effect but beyond that which is it's it's narrower than you might think it's I, I, if i'm remembering correctly it's about 30 feet but beyond that there's actual benefits so it really depends on the speed of the traffic the number of cars and the the proximity to the actual roadway so there's a number of variables there it's not like a yes or no kind of thing. It's like probably not for some of these, you know, interstate highway, express highway kind of situations, but for certainly for residential streets where you have low speed limits and not very large volumes of traffic, that's overall, it would definitely be a beneficial thing. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jonathan. 
So thanks all for sticking with us. I just want to um, throw up on the screen a couple of a few activities from our Project Wild guide. I know we have quite a few Project Wild folks on the phone. So Tanya, Rachel, Kiki, Claire, Anita. Um, in the chat box, if you have any other suggestions that I have missed, which is completely possible, um, throw them up in the chat box, please. But we have um, insect inspection, monarch marathon, ants on a twig, busy bees, busy blooms is a, a relatively new activity we have in our guide. Um, focused, and we try and do activities for a lot of different grade levels too. Um, in aquatic wild, we have an activity called Are You Me, which is about mm -hmm. the aquatic insects and the incredible change that they go through when they, how they look when they're as um, nymphs in the stream and then when they are adults flying around. And then in Growing Up Wild, um, an activity called Anton Parade. I breathe through that, but um, I do want to get to some other questions that we have. Keep typing your questions in the chat box. Um, oh, Jonathan, quick question. Sure. What was the name of the urban nesting article that you had talked about? You should put up a... Oh, yeah. That was in a thing called the Maryland Entomologist. And it is... That's a paper of myself and a student. I'll have to look that up. I can get that out to people. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll be sure to put that. Make sure yep. that gets on the website. Sure. And then... You know, for Thelma, do you have any information about um, or any opinions on a lot of people are focusing on non-native honeybees <laughs> because of the honey, which has definite benefits. Um, but do you, you know, do you think or do you see more of a trend towards people looking towards more native bees, especially here in North America? We are seeing a real interest now rising up in non-native bees. For one thing, um, bumblebees are, are becoming sort of one of the new darlings, which is I, I'm, I'm thrilled with bumblebees, so I'm very happy um, because they're, they're very docile creatures, um, for one thing. You know, and, and sometimes, you know, people have a little bit of, you know, they, they wonder a little bit about, you know, insects that, you know, can you promise, you know, if we put in a in a pollen in your garden that no one will ever get stung, which I have to tell them, no, I can't, you know. <laughs> but but of all the insects, you know, um, bumblebees are are extremely docile, and as are many species of our um, of our native bees, many of them are stingless. Um, not all of them, but but quite a few are. And you know, a lot of again the solitary nesting bees, um, as as um, as he had mentioned, um, they're not, as Jonathan had mentioned, they're not um, defending a nest. So, you know, they're just not as aggressive as other species. So, you know, people are, they're kind of, they're first of all delighted to find out there's a lot of other kinds of pollinators out there. And I see a trend in learning about them. I see a trend in, in you know, trying to um, add habitat for them. So yeah, it's it's kind of delightful to find out that people are interested. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'll just add to that and say that I, I worked around solitary bees now for several decades, and the number of times I've been stung is absolutely minuscule, and it's usually because we're doing something like netting them, we're catching them in a net, and you're careless removing the bee from the net, and that's totally on you. It has nothing to do with the bee. Um, they're not they're not aggressive in the way of wasps or yellow jackets or hornets. So they're much, much more suitable for urban areas and schoolyards and playgrounds and those kind of environments. Okay. Well, we are at our time. So I want to thank everyone for participating. Again, the presentations and the link to this webinar and other um, resources will be on our Wild About Insects webpage, again, which I will email out to everyone who's registered. Um, also, uh, I will choose one lucky participant to receive a um, insect hotel of his or her choice. So um, I'll be in touch with the winner shortly. All right, so thanks everyone and uh, have a great week. Bye-bye. Great, thank you.